Hi, everybody. It's one o'clock Eastern time, 10 a.m. Pacific time, time to start this webinar. My name is Alan Wright. I am the founder and owner of a small company called Zephyr United. We are based in Red Lodge, Montana, population about 2,400, but we have operations that go around the world. We have got three different divisions. One is Zephyr Adventures, which has been running active tours around the world for the past 25 years. So that was our first and flagship division. And when I say division, it's still a small company. We also have Travel Montana, which is new for us, re recently added during the pandemic and focuses on tours into our home state of Montana and Yellowstone. Some of you might have been on a webinar we just ran last month on travel to Yellowstone and Montana. And the third one is Taste Vacations. That runs food, wine, and beer tours around the world. And that's the subject of this webinar, which is about wine country destinations in the U.S. beyond Napa. I am going to share my screen with all of you and do a little slideshow presentation. I'm hoping this whole thing will last no more than 45 minutes, possibly less. And then we'll also have time for Q&A at the end. So you'll be out of here for sure in an hour and maybe less if all goes smoothly. I didn't time it when I, when I went through it the first time. So let me share my screen. And I think you should be seeing it now. And this is the webinar, as I mentioned, Beyond Napa Wine Country Destinations in the United States. Before we get going on this, I want to talk about why this webinar and wine travel in general is important to you as travel agents. That's what this whole thing is about. I'm not really here to talk about wine tourism from the point of view of consumers. I'm really talking to you travel agents and why wine travel is important to you as agents. Wine travel is very popular. I'll go over that a little bit. Wine travelers tend to be the same types of people who also use travel agencies. So that's a good tie-in. Wine travel can be very profitable for agencies. Wine vacations are not easy to arrange. That's true for the end consumer. And it's also, frankly, true for travel agencies and travel agents. And the first wine vacation often leads to many more. Once people do this and realize it's possible and it's fun, it's something that they can repeat. Not, not like a, an anniversary tour or a wedding vacation. This is something you could be arranging for customers year after year. Goals of this webinar, really, I'm trying to provide you information <clears throat> so that you can sell wine travel. That's what this is all about. If you end up using us to, to book your clients wine travel, that's great. If you don't, that's fine too, not a problem. We are gonna go over three major US destinations that are not Napa. Sonoma, the northern Willamette Valley of Oregon, and the Walla Walla area in Washington. I'll talk a little bit about other wine regions, but on this webinar, we're going to talk about these three specifically. And I will explain how and why you might consider working with us, which of course is something that we hope um, to get out of this is, is further relationships with all of you. And at the end, just some housekeeping, we will do a Q&A. If you have a question, please don't put it in the chat box, which is scrolling on the right side, because I won't see that while I'm giving the webinar. Please put it in the ask a question area, which is in the center bottom. And then at the end, we'll go over that. If you have problems with your screen freezing or your sound disappearing, very first thing, just see if you can refresh your browser screen, and we have found that that often works. Hopefully that won't be a problem for you. And we will make a recording of this, a copy of this webinar available afterwards. And Beth in our office, who is the one who's been 
email them with you, we'll send it out by email. So who is the wine traveler? This is an important component, of course. Um, statistics on wine travel are very limited. And the reason is there's no, there's no general wine travel organization doing nationwide statistics. And instead, most all the studies come from individual regions or locations. So the state of Michigan will say, we would like to know what the impact of wine travel is on our state. And then they do a survey and they do an economic analysis and they come up with a bunch of statistics and they're always very impressive for that region, but no one conglomerates that all together, accumulates it into one study. Um, so we don't really know exactly. What we do know, all of you know, hopefully, is that there's a post pandemic boom in travel right now. We had our worst year ever in 2020. We had our best year ever in travel in 2021. A large part that was because of Montana. A lot of people wanted to go outside, wanted to stay domestically, and we we're the experts there. But in addition, we are now having an even better year in 2022. And that's not because of Montana, that's because of our locations worldwide. So there is definitely a post pandemic boom that's happening now, certainly within the tour tour industry. There are 93 million regular wine drinkers in the US. So these are people that say, yes, I drink on a regular basis. Doesn't mean every day, it could mean every week, but nevertheless, these are the people that are potential for engaging in wine travel as well. And then the key, of course, is to find those people who are ready to spend the time and the money on wine travel. And that's not all of wine drinkers. The people that we're interested in, and I think the people that you should be interested in for this segment of your business are as follows. It's the older crowd, you know, not older. I don't think 70 is old anymore. <laughs> I'm getting up, you know, in age myself. Um, 50 to 70 are the people that are the people that have oftentimes the time and the money to travel. That's who travels with us. That's who pays the money to have us take care of their vacations. I'm guessing a lot of times those are also your customer base. That's the wine traveler. Um, well, you can go to wine regions all over the place and see young folks who just drop in and do that. That's not who you're interested in because they are very much more likely to do it ad hoc and not as an organized basis. Wine travelers tend to be highly educated. They're very social and adventurous. They like to try new wine regions. This is one of the reasons we're giving this webinar. Um, there tend to be couples and empty nesters because those are the folks that have, you know, someone to travel with and yet the time to do it also. They're, they have the discretionary income to pay more to get something that's nice that they don't have to worry about arranging themselves. They indulge in luxury too, right? Any wine region is essentially the sale of luxury. You can go anywhere, you can get any wine brand, you can go to the store and get anything, but people aren't looking for just anything. They're looking for something special and the wine regions are offering that. It is a special type of vacation. And they will return to great relationships and places and that includes us and that includes you, of course. These are the wine travelers I'm talking about who are our business this is these are the things we find are are similar aspects of our wine travelers and the ones we see in wine regions that probably are similar to your clientele too so talking about arranging wine tourism really there are four ways to do this the first one is on your own without making any reservations so this was classic in for example the movie sideways where the friends went in Southern California area and they were going out and they would just pop into different places and say hello and drink and taste and it and it worked great and there's an adventurous aspect to that. So that's definitely a huge part of the industry, but it is disappearing and it's disappearing because of the pandemic. And during the pandemic, wineries, had to 
manage their flow of people and their limited staffing. And to do that, they started to require reservations. Even ones that had been open for visitation for decades had to, they felt, create a reservation system. And here's the thing, they liked it. They like it now, even when they don't need it anymore, many, many of them are still continuing it. And the reason is they can manage what's going on, right? They know how many people are coming when, and they can staff appropriately, but also they can give the visitor a much better experience. One of our critiques of old school wine tourism is that you bellied up to the tasting room bar and they gave you your standard flight. It used to be free in a lot of places. It no longer is. But nevertheless, you're dealing with kind of the low end staff on the totem pole, the person with the least amount of knowledge. And they are dealing with eight people at once who are out at that tasting room bar. And it's, and it's a slap dash experience that doesn't produce great raves or repeat customers for the winery. Now they're having people book a table of four. It's an hour and a half experience. They know that they're getting a flight of six wines. They can upgrade to better wines. They will have someone coming to their table who comes and talks about each wine. And it's better for everybody. It's better for the winery and better for the, uh, the consumer. And so the on your own without reservations is not something you are involved in. It's not something we're involved in, but it's disappearing on your own with reservations. As I've just talked about is much, much more common. It's still not something that necessarily you'll be involved in because many of the people will just look up on a website and book it themselves. But if they're looking for a whole wine country vacation and you are going to do it on your own, well, then this is how you're going to do it. You're going to go to the wineries and figure out, which ones to visit and what times and which experiences to do. And you can book them online. Number three is to use a local wine tour operator. We really love this option. These are day tours or half day tours, and they're really good. These operators, if you have a good one, are taking people to not just the big wineries, but also small ones. So they get a variety and they're providing a guide who knows what's going on and can talk to people during the trip, not necessarily when they're in the winery, but also outside. And hopefully the winery even knows them and will greet the people and maybe give a special experience. So for a reasonable amount of money, like maybe 150, 180 bucks for a day or a half day, you get a really good experience. So if you are approached by someone saying, hey, I want to go to Napa, because that's where they all want to go at first, you could book all their reservations on your own, like number two, or you could consider using a wine tour operator. Where that fell, falls short, of course, is when somebody's going on vacation to do this. So if they're in the same area or they're just gonna be in the area for business and they wanna add a day, that makes a ton of sense. If they wanna make a vacation and they live in Ohio and they wanna go to Napa, then it's more complicated to book this every day. You could, in theory, book the same tour operator every day, you don't really know that they have expertise in doing multiple wine tours. You hope that the guy that they get is good. You also still have to book their hotels and their flights and their meals separately. Um, and so the number four option is to use a vacation wine tour operator like us, where we arrange multi-day trips for people in wine regions. We know the wineries to visit. We know how many we should add in in a day. We add in usually other activities other events. We do the hotels, the ground transportation. We have a guide. We tell people where and when to fly into, and it's all set. So that's what we do for people directly and also for agencies. And I'll talk later about how to do, how to, how to work with us. Now let's talk about wine regions in North America. All 50 states have a winery, even Alaska, but not all wineries grow their own grapes. And so a winery that's buying grape juice from a California winery is not producing something that's amazing, not only because they don't have any idea what the grape juice is probably, but very likely that grape juice, they call it, is not grape juice, but it's wine juice, is usually the bulk that is being shipped from there to wherever they're shipping it. 
And so what you're really interested and also a winery doesn't make for a wine vacation, right? It's not the winery, it's the wine region that's so beautiful. So what you're really looking for are American viticultural areas. The problem is there are 260 of them in the United States. So they're all over the place. 142 of those are in California. So if you say, if someone says to you, I want to go to California for a wine vacation, you're, you can say, oh, really? Which of the 142 ABAs do you want to go to? And they won't have any idea. And you won't either, frankly, and neither would I about all of those ABAs. That's why we're talking about a narrow selection. 27 states have an ABA. So that means 27 states are really eligible to do a wine tour vacation. Some of them aren't very appropriate. Some aren't, frankly, producing that great a wine. Some don't have enough wineries per geographic region to make to be able to turn it into a wine region. Um, Napa is the big daddy, but there are many others that are really good for wine tourism. Virginia, the New York Finger Lakes, Arizona, Western Colorado, the Texas Hill Country, and even to an extent Idaho, although it's pretty spread out there. Those are all super interesting places for wine tourism. Um, we don't run tours in those places. You know, I should say, too, that one of our expertise areas is that we run wine conferences. We run two. I founded two. One's the Wine Media Conference. One's the Wine Marketing and Tourism Conference. Through that, we talk to hundreds of wine industry folks every year, and we get to know these places. Those conferences move around. We've run conferences in Virginia and the Finger Lakes, for example. Um, we don't run tours there because it's got to be a balance, right? You want to go to a neat, interesting wine region. But you want to go what you need to pick wine regions to represent that you actually that people will be interested to go to. And they're not generally asking for vacations to Virginia or the New York Finger Lakes. They're doing those for day trips. Um, so instead, we're going to focus on three of them. And the first is the California region of Sonoma County. It's right next to Napa. So I don't know if you can see this. I think you can. My cursor here. This is Napa County. Everything around in the block, black line is Sonoma County. And Sonoma County has historically been very different from Napa. It's laid back. It's less well known. Um, because there's less interest in it, there have been less demand, which leads to less, lower, less visitation, lower prices, and more availability. That's changed. Sonoma has become very popular in the last 15, 20 years. And it's, in my mind, in our minds, it's as good as Napa County for wine tourism because it's got more diversity in some ways. You can see that it goes all the wine regions are include practically most of the county and it includes over here on the Pacific Ocean, the mod moderating influence of the ocean winds brings in the, the lower temperatures and you get very, on the Sonoma coast, you get very, very different grape growing regions and thus very different wines from, for example, the rock pile here, which is up in the hills. What we really like is the Northern Sonoma County area. And, and that includes the three primary areas around this are the Alexander Valley, the Dry Creek Valley and the Russian River Valley. You've got other ones like Knights Valley and Chalk Hill, but those three are big. They have a lot of wineries. They've got fantastic wines and really nice about this area of the world for wine tourism is that little dot in the middle, Healdsburg, which is one of the cutest wine towns in the United States and really in the world. It's small, it's manageable. It has a central plaza. It has hotels that are right near the plaza. It's got restaurants, excellent restaurants. It has a half a dozen, it has a dozen wineries right inside the town that have tasting rooms. So it's really perfect for wine tourism. When we do our Northern Sonoma County tour, we stay all four nights in Healdsburg, right on the square. We take people to four different restaurants that are excellent, that are within walking distance. And then we go out to three different AVAs, the Alexander, Dry Creek, and Russian River Valleys for the three full days of a five-day tour. It's really great because you get different wines and different wineries in each of those AVAs with the Russian River being a little cooler, 
having more whites and the Alexander Valley being hottest and having a lot of calves, Cabernet Sauvignon. So um, it's a it's a fantastic place to go. I can highly recommend it if someone says to you, I want to go to California for wine country. And they say, you, you know, your first question is, well, have you ever been out there to wine country? And do you have anything in mind? If they don't, Sonoma County is a great option for you. It's well known. It's got everything. And it's not quite the hustle and bustle of Napa County. Having said that, it's more popular now and the prices are going up. It's very difficult to drop in and have a free tasting at any winery there. And that is the reality of it. In five years from now, we might not be running one there. It's it's excellent now, but it's getting popular and we might end up choosing other ones. A couple just uh, quick slides of the area. You can see it's beautiful and not flat. It adds the the uh, elevation change adds to the beauty. <clears throat> now, number two, the Oregon Willamette Valley. So Oregon is a major state for producing wine in the United States. Really the big four are California, Washington, Oregon, and New York. In terms of high ranked wines, it's most of them are coming from Oregon, Washington, and California. And that's one of the reasons why Oregon makes for good wine tourism. People know about it. They know about the Willamette Valley. They know about the Pinot Noirs from Oregon. Therefore, they're interested in going. Oregon is um, much is a, is a very diverse state. It has wine regions in the west, which is tends to be rainier, and in the east. You can see the Snake River Valley over here. Out here is the area around Bend, Oregon. Um, up in this area is the Columbia Valley and the Columbia Gorge. The Columbia Valley is also on the Washington side of the river. That's the Columbia River there. And you've got Southern Oregon, which is fantastic. We are likely to be adding a Southern Oregon tour relatively soon. It's very hot in the wine industry. It's not that hot among consumers yet. And then you have the Willamette Valley. That's what everybody knows about Oregon. It is pronounced the Willamette, not the Willamette. Um, and it's Oregon, not Oregon. Um, and in the Willamette Valley, it's still a big valley. You can see that it goes all the way from Portland down to Eugene. That's a two and a half hour drive. It's a big valley. And, it, and, it's, and it's got a bunch of different AVAs in there. The thing with Oregon is that it's not all the Willamette Valley that produces the best wines. We like the South, but most of the top wines come from the North part, and they're not actually coming from the Willamette Valley floor, which is perfect thanks to the glaciation runoff from the Missoula floods during the last ice age, which is more than most of you need to know. But because of that, the valley floor is covered with really rich soils. Those rich soils are perfect for growing wheat and fruit, but they're not perfect for growing wine grapes. And the reason is you want wine grapes to suffer a little bit and you don't want them to be too um, voluptuous in, in their growth because if, you, if they are, they produce less flavor per ounce of juice, the wine juice that gets pressed and made into wine. So you really want actually harder locations to grow grapes. And that means the sides of the valley, not the tops. So what we do on our Oregon wine tour is we go to the northern end of the Willamette Valley and we only are in the hillsides that are above the valley floor. We do, just like in Sonoma, we have a five-day tour and we do th our three main do days in three different AVAs. One is the Yamhill Carlton district, which is probably the most well-known district in Oregon and has some fantastic wines. We go to the Dundee Hills, this one here, and then we go to one that's called Ribbon Ridge, which is not even on this map, um, but should be because it's one of the newer areas, but really doing great stuff. Here's the thing about Oregon. Here's why people should want to go to Oregon. 
Pinot Noir is very hard, complex, finicky grape for wine growers, wine grape growers. However, it's expressive, maybe one of the most expressive wine grapes of the local terroir. And so by going to this area of the world, you can learn more about wine than you will in most any of your wine vacations that people take. So because there's so much Pinot Noir grown in that area and Chardonnay on the white side, um, that it's easy to compare. So you can go to a, if when we go to the Yamhill Carlton district on one day and then the Ribbon Ridge on a second, we then take, taste similar Pinot Noirs from similar years, but from different regions right across the valley from each other. And they taste totally different. And we learn from the winemakers and the owners why it is they think their terroir produces a certain flavor in their wines. So I would recommend Sonoma for sort of the first time wine traveler who wants to go someplace famous, but doesn't want to pay the prices of Napa Valley hotels and restaurants and wineries. I would recommend Oregon for the experienced wine drinkers who want who know what they like and want to learn about winemaking and, and wine grape growing. Um, and here are a few slides on Oregon. You can see that the grapes here are above the valley floor off in the upper left. Same here, the winery is above the valley floor. And there you go again, the grapes are on the hillside. In Napa and Sonoma, by the way, that's not always the case. Oftentimes it's in the valley floor, but they have a very different climate there. It doesn't affect it. And they don't grow as much in terms of Pinot Noir either. Um, so Oregon really is nice for Pinot Noir. Now we're on to our third one, which is Washington. So Washington is essentially two states. It's the west and the east, and it's divided by the Cascade Mountain Range right down here in the middle. On Western Washington, which is where Seattle is and Tacoma and the vast majority of Washington state's population, all the weather comes in from the west off the Pacific Ocean. It's laden with moisture. It cannot keep traveling up and over the Cascade Mountain Range, so it drops its moisture on the west side of the state, which is really the, the west third of the state, really, or 40% maybe. Um, that means it's it's beautiful and lush and green and not great for grape growing. And you just don't have very many grapes grown on the on the west side. You can see that Puget Sound is an ABA, but it's not significant. It's really just that a lot of wineries have put tasting rooms on the west side because that's where the population center is. All the grapes, and that's the wine region and thus wine tourism, happen on the east side of Washington. The vast majority of visitors to Washington never even go to the east side of Washington. It's historically been farming, ag, and um, and Walla Walla itself has been an ag town. This has changed with the advent of wine grapes because they have been so successful in producing really great wines over there. So you can see there's a lot of area here in general, this Columbia Valley area is more the typical ag region where they're growing wheat and apples and pears. It's not as great for wine grapes. And so it's not as well known for wine tourism. We don't go there. Um, instead, we're looking at these ones down here. So the Rattlesnake Hills, the Red Mountain, the Horse Heaven Hills, and the Walla Walla Valley areas. That's what's producing the, the best wine grapes from Washington State. Um, and here you see it a little bit closer. Again, similar to Northern Sonoma, what makes this area an amazing wine tourism destination is in part the quality of the wines and the variety of wines you get there you can always impress somebody by buying a good quality of Washington wine and bringing it to a dinner party or ordering it off the menu. Because a lot of people have heard of it, but a lot of people don't know anything about it. Um, 
So I like to do that because you get high quality wines for a reasonable price out of this area of the state. And the key is to focus on the ones that have a smaller designation, right? If it comes from Horse Heaven Hills or Red Mountain instead of the Columbia Valley, then um, you're probably going to get a better quality wine. The second reason this area is so great is because of the town of Walla Walla. It's cute. It is one of the cutest little wine tourism destinations in the world. It used to be an ag town. It's still an ag town, but that ag town is now mixed in with wine grape, which is also agriculture. And that means that there are some really nice hotels there. There are half a dozen excellent restaurants and another dozen that are good. And it's got a dozen tasting rooms all within walking distance of the main area of central Walla Walla. And it tends to be less expensive and more welcoming because there are fewer tourists still going to this area of the wine tourism world. Um, so if you have customers that are saying to you, yeah, we've already been to Walla, we've already been to Napa. We've, in fact, we've been to Sonoma and we've been to Bordeaux. We're thinking about doing something else. You can recommend Washington because it's high quality and not as visited. And we definitely love this as a location really for everybody, but because people want to often start with California, this is a good one for people who are um, already experienced and have been to different wine regions around the world. So those are the three um, here's Washington. You can see the taste room looks sort of like a barn. That one definitely is a barn turned into a tasting room. Those are the Walla Walla Hills above the vineyards, which are down below. And, and I wanted to talk a little bit about what we do because we can't help you with everything. If you have somebody who says, I want to do a day in wine country, we can't do that because we only do multi-day vacations. We only do guided multi-day vacations. And that means it's the whole package. As I mentioned to you, food, lodging, guide, local transportation, winery visits. We do mostly private tours. So we get a group of four coming to us um, and saying that they want to go on one of our locations. That's great. We get um, a travel agency and they say we have a group of eight. That's perfect too. We also have a few public tour dates we put on every year, but it's not a big part of what we do. Most of the time, this audience prefers to have their own group. And we generally are not doing this for couples. It's just not economical to run a guided tour for two people. The price would be too high for us to be able to make the money in total that we need to make to justify the time it takes to put into a vacation like this. So generally, we're talking four or more days and we're talking four or more people. We at Taste Vacations run not just wine tours, but food, wine, and beer tours. Um, we've got 12 locations worldwide. So you can go to our website, tastevacations.com, see those 12 locations. Those are easy, and we've picked the best ones. So it's easy for you to go to there and pick those and recommend those to your travelers, your customers, because we already have them set up. If somebody comes to us and wants to customize a tour, we can do that. Um, it's not as easy. We generally require a non-refundable deposit to do major customizations. If they just want to change out a winery here for a winery there, that's not a big deal. If you have a group of eight that wants to go to a wine region we don't go to, then we're interested. We'd have to be honest with you and let you know if we can do it in a great way we don't like to do anything that's not amazing but um, it's a possibility if it's for four people much less likely we can create a brand new tour somewhere where we're not running them already this is how we work with you we work with travel agencies all the time all the time um, but we're small you don't have to register you're on our list you got an email you're on you you are registered for this webinar you don't have to register with us we know who you are. As long as you're a legit travel agency, then you will earn a 10% commission on each book guest. You earn that commission on the entire package. This is important, right? Because if you have somebody coming to you and say, we want to go to Sonoma County 
for a five day vacation. And you can put that together yourself. And then you can get a commission, hopefully, on the airline flights, on the maybe on the hotels, maybe, maybe not, probably not on the restaurants, sometimes, sometimes not on the wineries. You're going to have to ask each one. You can't just go book it online like we do because we don't generally look for commissions ourselves to get on those. We're just dealing with group rates when we book our hotels. And then we charge you, charge your customer the whole package and you make the commission on the entire package. And it's a huge difference. You know, the cost of the components might be 2000 but when you add in a guide and all our services and package together, it might be $4,000 and you make that 10% commission with one phone call or email to us. Um, and you make double the commission you'd make if you did it on your own. We can handle the communications for you if you want, and we don't have to if you prefer not to. So if you've got a group of six and they want to go to Washington, you could, once they, you know, once you give them the overview information and they say, yeah, we're in, then we can handle it from there if you want. We can take the booking, we can take the money, we can answer all their questions and you still get your commission or you can say well i'm going to do it all myself we're going to run the money through us we're going to handle the communications through us it doesn't matter to us we are happy to do individual webinars for you if you're interested um, we can do them for groups of agents if you have a, if you're in a big office or have a regional group for example or if you have your own database of people and you want to specifically sell one tour um, we also have agents that want to travel with the groups and we do do that a lot too. Obviously we have to package that in. We have to price it in, right? Because if you want to do traveling with us at no charge and get the commission, we just have to make sure it works. It generally does not work for four and you're probably not wanting to go with a group of four, but if you have eight or 10 or more, then we can usually make that work as well. So that's who we are. This is our information, tastevacations.com. You can reach Beth at info at or Beth at. <clears throat> and you can reach me either at Alan at tastevacations.com or Alan at zephyrunited.com. If you go to zephyrunited.com, you'll see our whole, our whole shebang. And I'm going to go back here and I'm going to stop screen sharing. And that's the webinar. I hope that all of you enjoyed it. Um, it was pretty quick. Let me see what my timing is. 38 minutes. I said I'd be done 45. So that's pretty good, right? Everybody's busy. I've got some questions in here. I will take those. If you don't stay for those, just know that um, a couple of things. One is that I'm, we will be asking you if you're interested in a similar webinar that focuses on other destinations, say outside the U.S. We'll talk about that shortly. Hang on for that. And Beth will send you an email just wrapping it up um, so that you can ask us any questions you want. So going into the questions, I put this first one in there before we started, just so I remember. Would you be willing to do a webinar on international wine tourism destinations? We'd love to hear from you. We purposely kept this to three so that it was reasonable. There is still a demand for U.S. for sure. We're seeing lots of demand for foreign, but we're still seeing people who are hesitant about that. Um, I'm Beth is going to Beth, if you could put the contact information right now in the chat, somebody's asking for that. My email is Alan, A L L A N at tastevacations.com. If anybody's interested in a similar webinar that talks about wine tourism destinations around the world, put it in here in the chat. And if we get a lot of response, we can do that. Can any of the slides? be screenshots on our end talk oh beth already answered that i think you can take any screenshots you'd like beth says there you go do you ever, ever offer vegan wine tours all right so if you're talking about vegan wine or vegan wine tours those are two entirely different things right so vegan wine tours we could adapt to that um it would be very difficult to do a vegan wine wine tour because most wineries probably don't even pay attention to that because most people are not asking about that, right? There are generally no 
for the higher quality wines, there are no wine pro no no animal products in them. For a high quality wine, it's a limited number of products, and it doesn't include funky products like animal products. Um, so we would have to ask if it's a group that's large enough, we could check into that, you know, six or, or more, we could check into that and probably make that happen. Yes. Are restaurant visits included in the package? Yes. It depends on each tour. Um, in general, all breakfasts are included, either all or all but one dinner included. Sometimes if we're in a really cute little town, we let people do a one dinner on their own. We usually include one or two lunches as well and then leave one or two on their own so people can do that. What's the best time of year to visit? Well, that's a great question. So everyone is different, right? Oregon, because it's on the west side, is rainy. Um, if you're there, the best time to visit is probably, you know, you also have to pay attention to the fact that Oregon is getting hot in the summer. But the summertime is the best weather for Oregon, for the northern Willamette Valley is the summertime. But you'll be more crowded then too. So I think we would probably prefer September. It tends to get less rain than June, the other shoulder. For Washington State, um, it could be, it's less crowded anyway. So I don't think we're as worried about summer months. So anytime between May and October is pretty good. And really April through October, it could be cold in April and October over there. But you can do that anyway. It's not keeping you. It's not generally going to be snowing on you. And in Sonoma, uh, it is hot and crowded in the summer. So our favorite months there are April and May when you've got new, fresh growth on the vines and September, October, even November when the weather's still pretty good. And it's beautiful because the vines are laden in September with the fruit still, and then they're coming off, but there's still a lot of foliage that makes it really beautiful um, in the fall. Have the Napa and Sonoma wineries recovered from the fires from a few years ago? Yeah, actually there were two sets of major fires and they were brutal, but the reality is they didn't affect most wineries. Very few wineries were burnt, very few. Um, and you'd never know it. You'd never know it by going to that area of the world that there was any fires there. So yes, the answer is, not only are they recovered, but you just wouldn't even see it when you go there. Um, why don't we do Napa? <clears throat> so I sort of insinuated that, but it's just busier and crowded and more expensive. And we like Sonoma County as the alternative. We can give people a more diverse experience that is um, less cookie cutter where you're just doing the same things that other tourists do. We, we can introduce people to the winemakers and winery owners much more easily in Sonoma than we can to Napa. Um, I just addressed the timing. Yeah. If anybody loves Pinot's, Oregon's fantastic. It's a great state for P So if you have people who know Pinot's or know wine and really want to learn about the wine graping, then wine grape making, then, uh, sorry, the wine grape growing and the wine making that Oregon, that northern Willamette Valley, Valley area is excellent. It says, if I have a group of 14 and need luxury accommodations and unique excursions with fine dining, chef-inspired menus and private wine tastings, can you do all that? Yes. With a group of 14, we can do a lot. It's much easier for us to customize for a larger group, right? Um, but also we run trips like that. We have a group that we run, for example, you'll see on our website with a professional musician named Mindy Bear. That's very high end. We're staying in five star accommodations. We're eating in five star restaurants. We're doing the five star tastings. So we know that stuff also and can easily do it. Um, average five day and seven day trip cost, a five day trip is going to be around, uh, in, in general, we're pricing the taste vacations tours around $600 a day. So $3,000 for a five day tour in the US and you know, 4,000 plus for a European tour. And then when we get to other locations, we run tours in Chile and Argentina and in South Africa, and those often are longer and then they're, they're a little bit more expensive also. By the way, what is, where does that put us in terms of the tour industry? In the middle. 
we are not low end and we're definitely not high end. By not staying in those five star hotels, we are able to cut our our costs down and thus our prices down. And that's one of the reasons we're we're a four star hotel company on average, because as all of you know, you pay a lot for that extra star sometimes. Can you put up the contact info again? I think it's up there. Um, and Beth has just put it up again. Info at tastevacations.com and mine is alan at tastevacation.com. So here's the thing with travel agencies experiencing our tours. We run very few tours that are group public tours. They're almost all private tours and therefore we can't put you on a tour easily. We can't put you into some other private groups. So it's very difficult for us to have you come experience our tours on discounted rates even. It, we, because we don't offer those tours very often. So unfortunately that's not part of what we're, we're doing. Um, do you do a prepackage from SFO? Yeah, so the good that's a good question. We generally are planning the trip airport to airport. And, and so that's for a private tour group, especially if they're all flying into the same airport and flying in at the same time, then we will meet them at the airport. If they're coming in at different times, then oftentimes we also provide an option for meeting at the uh, first hotel where we're staying as well. Um, no, so the group, the group is generally four or more. We have a couple locations on our website that do do them for two or more, but most of our locations are for four or more. A few are for six or more. So everyone is different and they're all listed on the, the site. And really it's about economics. If we can run that tour at a lower cost, then um, we can run it for a smaller group. And the copy of the webinar, yes, um, that will be sent out to Beth essentially right now. So I think we've hit the last of that. I hope you've appreciated this and enjoyed it. And most importantly, I hope it's been useful for you. This was our main goal to give you as agencies information. Email is a great way to communicate with us. Definitely we can do a call too. You're not always likely to reach us by phone because we're a virtual company and have been for 16 years. But if you need to talk on the phone, we can always arrange that and just send us an email and we're good at getting back to you. Beth for general questions or me for specific questions about regions or um, this webinar. So thank you very much. Hope you all appreciated it and we'll do another one soon and we'll check our comments again if you were interested in one of these that just covers international wine destinations and I can talk about the individual aspects of those. Let me know. We can, we can think about doing that as well. Thank you.